ಕರುಣಾರ್ಣವಮಾಯ್ ಕರುದಗ್ಗತಿ ನಲ್ಗು ಅರುಣಾಚಲ ಶಿವ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಸೊ ದಿ ಟೆಂಪಲ್ ಬೆಲ್ ಟೋಲ್ಸ್ ಟು ರಿಮೈಂಡ್ ಅಸ್ ದಟ್ ದೆಫ್ is everyone's our death is that which is most our own because nobody can take it nobody can have it for us and nobody can stop it the buddha said your death is born along with your birth that which has a beginning also has an end so today we're going to talk about wrong views of death well first of all what is a view a view is a way of looking at things how we look determines what we see this is a very important principle in quantum mechanics that according to how we measure something that's what we're going to find <laughs> so spirituality is a lot like quantum mechanics it's very subjective it's irreducibly complex now we have a lot of wrong views because we've been trained up in a certain way and a wrong view in this context is any view that gets in the way of self realization the buddha enumerated 62 wrong views in his brahma jala sutta i have a link to it in the video description out of those 62 38 were about death and the afterlife So these wrong views have to be given up surpassed transcended <laughs> or educated away and there are so many it's hard to even know where to start but in the process of yoga there are eight steps and the first two are yama niyama yama means what should be done niyama means what should not be done and most people have lots of wrong views about this the very first item of yama is that one should accept a guru now, how many of us even think about having a guru <laughs> yet this is the very first item and if the first item is wrong everything that depends on it is also going to be wrong So if one accepts a guru who is a commercial salesman or who is a cultist or who is into power and money then the results are not going to be very good. My advice to finding a guru is to go to a holy place and find someone who is realized but not popular. <laughs> like my sanyas guru. My sanyas guru was a local guy here in India and he on the outside although he's a sanyasi he was just a regular guy i mean he would joke and talk small talk with people without any sense of being the big guru or you know some kind of holier than thou guy but at the same time within himself he was highly realized and his death was beautiful i was there and we'll talk about that later but one should accept a guru my buddhist guru nyanananda bhikkhu was the same way he was highly realized he wrote many wonderful books which i highly recommend and there's also a link to his books in the description 
But he was never very popular. I think because he was too advanced and also too iconoclastic. He didn't consider himself a Buddhist. <laughs> because, as he said, Buddhism is in a degenerate stage. And this goes for every religion. So you're not going to find a, a good guru in the mainstream religions. Look off in the weeds, look out in the woods, look in the shady places. Huh? There you'll find uh, unknown gems. Anyway, so there are much, much more wrong views that most of us subscribe to because we're trained in them from the very beginning. For example, the attachment to the senses. This is also known as extroversion. Having the attention always outside. And this is trained into us from the very beginning of life. When the parents come to the crib and, you know, tickle the baby and make funny sounds and faces to entertain and bring the attention out into the world. But having consciousness of the world is the source of suffering. And especially suffering in regards to death. So then consider school. In school, you have to pay attention, right? Or you'll get chastised as being a daydreamer. Well, what's wrong with being a daydreamer? Einstein, one of the most famous scientists ever, developed his theory of relativity as a Gedanken experiment, which means a mind experiment. He never set foot in a physics lab. He developed the whole thing by daydreaming. So there's nothing wrong with being an introvert, with being a dreamer, huh? as long as this dreaming has some purpose to it, some focus, some direction. And of course, this is the spiritual discipline, and that comes from the guru. So again, we could go on and on and on chaining these things, but let's talk about death. Wrong views concerning death are, for example, that death is bad. No, it's not bad. You signed up for it when you were born. Try to understand. <clears throat> it's just natural. It happens to every creature that has a beginning. That's why even the gods at the end of the universe have to die and be absorbed back into Brahman for the next creation. So there's nothing wrong in this. There's nothing bad in it. Try to understand. The only reason it seems bad is because of our view that we are attached to the present body. We think the body is the self. But wait a minute. The Buddha said there are three things about the manifested world that it's impermanent, that it's unsatisfactory, and that it's not self. So the body, being part of the world, is impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not self. Why should we expect it to be anything else? And if we do, that's a wrong view, and it's a cause of suffering, especially around the time of death. Or another wrong view of death is that somehow it's unfair. Why does this happen to me? <clears throat> well, it's happening to you because you were born. <laughs> There's no way out of this. <laughs> the body is going to die. It's destined. It's karma. It's cause and effect. Because you were born, death is certain. Now, how do we overcome these wrong views? Like death is unfair, or I have unfinished business, or this is my body, how can it die, you know? Uh, these things have to be overcome before death is imminent. While you're still young, while you're strong enough 
to do the work to overcome these wrong views. And of course, the work is education and meditation. One should be educated by one's guru, and one should meditate and practice what one has been taught. This is the path. Huh? This is the spiritual path. Really, the whole spiritual path, one of its most important purposes is to help you deal with death. But you can't wait until the last minute. Huh? There's a Zen saying, die now, avoid the rush. <laughs> the rush comes when you realize, oh my God, this body is dying. I have to do something about it. Well, by that time, it's too late. You have to take it as your duty in this life. One of the prime things you have to accomplish is to take a good attitude, a right view on death. And that's all it takes, you know? It's not really such a big deal, except that these views of ours are chiseled in granite stone. I mean, they're really pernicious and they're hard to uproot. Why? Because these views are old, old mental habits from previous lives, vasanas. So because of these views and the upadis, the coverings of our real intelligence, of our real identity, of our real nature, huh? we think that we are the body, the body is mine, and everything connected with the body is mine. Huh? And then if I have to leave all these things because of death, I feel deprived. I feel a big loss. I'm suffering. So to avoid this suffering, one must cut off these attachments before death comes. And that's why the spiritual path always advises renunciation. Renunciation doesn't mean just physically giving things up. It means mentally giving things up and no longer considering them I or mine. The body is not the self. The proof of that is every night when we go to sleep, we enter a different world where we have a different body that functions according to different laws and principles. Uh, where things are possible that are impossible in waking consciousness. And then we go into deep sleep and all of that disappears. Both the manifested world and the dream world. Then where is our body? See, the view of spirituality is that subjectivity is far more important than objectivity. Material science uses the principle of reductionism. Reductionism means you make an experiment and you control all the variables except one. Then you observe to see, you know, to see what that variable is going to do. But in the subjective world, you cannot do that. Reductionism doesn't work in the subjective world because the self, the being, huh? the body, mind, and consciousness put together are too complex. And you can't take away one and leave the others <laughs> because that would kill you. <laughs> you can't separate the being. The being is one thing, a gestalt, an aggregate. So, the scientific method that we have been taught doesn't apply in the subjective world. This is why scientists deny subjectivity. It's because their methodology doesn't work. Not because there's anything wrong about it, not because we won't be able to discover immense secrets by investigating it, but because we need a different method, that's all. And they're attached to their books, they're attached to their calculations and formulas. <laughs> And all of that doesn't work in the subjective world. In the subjective world, we have to take the advice of a guru. We have to take the advice of the scriptures and put that into action in our lives. And by doing that, 
we become free of all fear of death. Aum Tat Sat, Aum Shakti Aum.